here this evening. We're thankful for your presence. We appreciate you coming. And we know, of course, that you came for the purpose of worshiping God. And we hope that that's exactly what we can do here this evening. We've already had just wonderful spirited singing. Uh, we have been able to pray together. And we'll be able to do that again, I'm sure, before the night is over. And now we can open our Bibles and we can talk about God's Word and we can see how God's Word might be able to help us as we live. So thank you very much for, for coming and giving me the opportunity to be able to have just a small portion in your life and maybe something can be said that will help you. If you have any questions about anything that you hear me say, please do not hesitate to ask me. I'll be glad to do everything I can uh, to help you to... Uh, come to a better knowledge of the scriptures. So thank you very much for letting me be a part of your life. In the long go, David, the sweet singer of Israel, confessed, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light to my path. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. David believed that God's word not only could lead him in the path of right, but that it actually did. In another place, in Psalm 119, verse 104, he said, Thy word, your precepts, from your precepts, I get understanding. Therefore, I hate every false way. And so David knew that for him to have understanding, he could find it in only one place. He could find it from the precepts, the word of God. In Psalm 119, verse 130, he said, The unfolding of your words gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. And when he talks about that picture, if you will, uh, being in a, a darkened room, it doesn't have to be absolutely dark. It's just a place where you're trying to see something and you quite, can't quite see it. I, I was in a situation like that earlier today. I was trying to read something and I couldn't read, uh, read. And so what I did is I reached over and I turned on a light and all of a sudden I was able to see. It gave light. It opened up and illuminated things so that I could understand what I was reading or could actually read and then understand your, the unfolding of your words gives light and it gives understanding to the simple. And you see the New Testament emphasizes this same characteristic of God. In 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16, all scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. I think we all see, we all understand that we have to understand God's law, and by understanding it, it is profitable. It's in, it's, it will help us. It will help us in the things that we teach. It will guide us in what to say. When things need to be corrected in others or in ourselves, uh, the Word of God is profitable for reproof. It's profitable for correction in our lives to find out what's right, what's not right, how to get right. And finally, for, it's profitable to train, to train us in righteousness. That's how to stay right. So the Bible is going to provide for us everything that we need to know. God's Word is going to bring us this understanding and help us to know more about Him. James 1 and verse 22 says, But prove yourself doers of the Word and not merely hearers only. We know that if we're going to be effective Christians, if we're going to do what God wants us to do, that we have to not just listen to what God says, but that listen, listening has to be translated into the things that we do, into the actions of our lives. Now, what I want to point out is that these passages presuppose that the common man, people like me and you, have the ability to be able to connect the dots, so to speak. That word connect the dots, or that phrase, or that figure of speech, connect the dots, is used to describe, uh, describe a person's ability or inability, as the case may be, to associate one idea with another, to find the big picture, to find information and then be able to take that information and to be able to use it in some practical way. Now, specifically tonight, I'm talking about connecting the information we have, that is our knowledge of the Scripture, what we know to be true, with how we live, with the choices that we make every day in our lives uh, about our priorities in life and so many other things. So we need to be able to take what we know, 
and then put it into application then in our lives. Now, I've observed in recent times uh, that there's sometimes a disconnect between what some people know or at least what they should know with what they do. What, there's a disconnect between what they know and what they do. Now, that's nothing new, is it? Uh, we, there, there's nothing new under the sun. And it's always been that way. Ever since the dawn of creation, man's had a problem really not just understanding God's word, but then in doing what he knows God's word to teach. There are sometimes people who can read a passage, searching for information, and yet overlook some of the simplest things that they need to do in order to be pleasing to God. But unfortunately, some people just can't, or they don't connect the dots. They're just not able to see and make that connection between what they read and what it must do in their lives. Now, I want to suggest to you that this is not a new problem. It's not a new problem. We see that Jesus was often frustrated by people who didn't connect the dots. Open your Bibles with me to the book of Matthew chapter 19. I want you to read with me a few passages here, a few, a few verses, as we, as we see some of the Jews of Jesus' day who had a problem connecting the dots. Regarding the permanence of marriage in this text, verse 3, some Pharisees came to Jesus testing him and asking, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any cause at all? And he answered and said, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? And said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. Now let's just notice the context. Here are these people who have come to Jesus, these Pharisees. They're testing Jesus. They're trying to find something by which they, some way by which they might entrap him. And they ask him, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any cause at all? And so many of the Pharisees believe that very thing, that you could divorce your wife just for any reason that you wanted to. And how did Jesus respond to them? He said, have you not read... And then he quoted from uh, Genesis chapter 1 and verse 27. In the beginning God made them male and female. And then from Genesis 2 and verse 24 where he said, And for this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and shall become one flesh. Have you not read that passage? You ask me this question. Have you not connected the dots? Have you not read this passage? And then Jesus connected the dots for them by saying, So they know they're no longer two but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. So Jesus had trouble with some people who just couldn't connect the dots. They could read the scriptures, but they wouldn't make the obvious, uh, uh, see the obvious answer to their questions from what they read. Now let's look again in, in Matthew chapter 21. And I want us to notice how that they're still having trouble connecting the dots. Because here, this time, it's going to be the chief priest and the scribes. Now, verse 14 of Matthew chapter 21 says this, And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. Now, you've got to keep that in your mind, because this is something very important to, to keep in your mind, given what's going to be said next. But when the chief priest and the scribes saw the wonderful things he had done, here's what Jesus had done, performed all these miracles, Chief priests and scribes, they saw it. Notice what happens next. And the children were shouting in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David. Now I just want you to notice that the children could connect the dots. They saw what Jesus did. And they could connect the dots and they could confess him for who he was. But when the Pharisees and the scribes and uh, chief priests saw this, what does the text tell us how they reacted? They said they were indignant. They were indignant. Now I want you to notice something else. And he said to him, do you hear what these children are saying? Do you, are you listening? They connected the dots. And Jesus said to them, yes, you, uh, yes, have you never read? Out of the mouths of infants and nursing babies you have prepared praise for myself. Have you not read even what the, the psalmist said about this in Psalm 8 and verse 2? That they would confess me? They were able to connect the dots, and you should too. That's the point. 
Now let's look at one of the passages. Let's look at Matthew chapter 22 this time. And let's look at verse 31 and 32. But regarding the resurrection of the dead, here were some people who had come to Jesus and had presented to him this uh, almost, at least they thought, unsolvable problem. And so Jesus said, but regarding the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was spoken to you by God? You know, you should be able to read and understand the truth about the resurrection. Have you not read from Exodus 3 and verse 6, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob had been dead for hundreds of years. And Jesus said, he's not the God of the dead, but of the living. And when the crowds heard this, they were amazed at his teaching. He said, why didn't you connect the dots? You who deny that there is a resurrection, why didn't you just read what this text says? You who didn't believe in angels or spirits, why didn't you read what this text says and understand the truth? They needed to know how to connect the dots. And I, honestly, we could spend all night just using illustration after illustration where Jesus and his inspired teachers uh, would expose the same thing in a lot of people where they might read the scriptures, but even in the reading of the scriptures might not be able to see how practically this impacted their lives. So in this lesson, I want to talk with you for a few minutes about reading and studying the scriptures and, and discerning its message for us here in the 21st century. So I, I've got to ask myself, where do I begin in talking about something like this? Well, I want to say that, first of all, I'm going to make some basic assumptions uh, that I think all of us here tonight will feel and, and will all understand. I, I'm going to just assume that you believe that the Bible is the Word of God. I, I don't think that you would be present here tonight if, if you really didn't believe that. It, it, I believe that you believe that the Bible is the Word of God. I'm going to assume tonight that you believe that it has been accurately transmitted to us in the English language. Now, I know that in just about every translation into the English that you might find from Greek to English, there might be some little nuance of something that might be tran better translated somehow else or somewhere else. And so, uh, but yet still we believe that the Bible not only is inspired of God, not only did it come from Him, but we believe that by far the majority of the places, it's been accurately translated to us so that we can know the law of, of God. I believe, I think, that most of you understand that it's important for us to spend our time reading the Scriptures. Now, I may be assuming something here uh, a little bit more generally than, than I ought to because I think sometimes there are a lot of people, a lot of Christians, who really do not see the need to read the Scriptures the way that they should. But I'm going to assume that tonight you believe that that's important, that you believe it's important to read the Scriptures. And I'm going to assume that you believe that the Bible and all its messages to us contains relevant information for us. Even though it was written 2,000 years ago for the most part, even though that's when the last inspired penman uh, put his uh, pen down after having, uh, after having revealed the last word, that still here 2,000 years later, the words that these inspired men spoke. These things are relevant to us today, and they're meaningful for us today. So with, with that in mind and those assumptions that we're going to make tonight, I want to suggest to you that when you read the Scriptures, there are three very important questions that you need to ask. You read the Scriptures, three extremely important questions. One is, what does the text actually say? I'm reading any specific, any select verse of Scripture or, or book of the Bible, and so I've got to ask myself, what does this say? Now, if you're like me, sometimes you'll run across a, uh, a passage of Scripture and you might scratch your head and you might not be completely sure what that text says. And so the first thing I want to suggest that, that you need to do when that happens is that you need to get another translation. Uh, another translation or two. And, and just read that same passage from another translation. It might be that you want to read a, a, a translation, something like the English Standard Version, which is a good translation, or even the New Christian Standard Bible, which is also a pretty good translation. 
And it's going to read different from the New American Standard. It's going to read different from the American Standard, the New King James and the Old King James. Uh, they'll read just a little bit different, might be able to help you understand what the text is saying. Now, if you're still having a little bit of trouble with that, then I want to encourage you to get your good English dictionary. You can even do that online if you want to and, and be able to see the definition of any English word. You want to understand what the text actually says, then just take your dictionary. I'm not ashamed to tell you that there are a lot of things, a lot of words in the King's English that I don't understand. So I need to go and I need to look that up. If you want to go just a little bit uh, deeper than that, you can actually go to a book like Vine's Expository Dictionary of Old and New Testament Words and, and you can read some things about Greek definitions uh, all through English and, and that will help you. That will help you understand what the text actually says. The second question that is so very important is what does the text mean? Once you understand what it says, then you've got to ask what does it mean? And I think we've got to go a little bit deeper here and say, what does the text mean to those people who first heard it? What did the text mean to its first uh, hearers? You know, I think when we look at the Bible, we all need to understand that we're reading somebody else's mail because all of these books were written to someone else. All of these books were, were written with another readership in mind. And yet here we are, we're reading what someone wrote to those people. Or what did those people understand that author to say? We may not always be able to ascertain that for sure. We may not always be able to put ourselves in their situation and understand culturally and contextually everything that they might have gained from that. But this certainly is true. A text cannot be made to mean something today that the original readers would never have intended. And so we need to know that. We need to remember that. And if you cannot put yourself in that position, you certainly can understand what the text says and by that then be able to ascertain what it means. So what does the text say? What does it mean? And the third question is very similar. Then how does this text apply to me? If I'm reading something that someone else wrote to somebody else, how can I know that this is relevant to me? What lessons can I draw from it, believing that it was written for people of all time to glean truth from it? What are these lessons that I need to take and put into practical application in the 21st century? That's so very important for us to be able to do. So when answering this last question, there are a number of other questions that, that come up that will help us to be able to connect the dots when we're reading the scriptures. And so I want to share with you some of these questions that, that help me when I'm reading and studying the scriptures. When I'm reading and studying the scriptures, I'm, I want to ask myself, is there something in this text that tells me about God? Is, is there something this text tells me uh, about my Father in heaven? Is there something this tells me about, about Jesus? For example, in Exodus chapter 34, I'm reading this Old Testament text and I realize that we're not under the Old Testament, we're under the New Testament as our standard rule and faith and practice today. But yet the Old Testament was written for our learning, right? Romans 15 and verse 4. We're to learn from the things that were written aforetime. Well, let's look at Exodus 34 and verse 6. The Bible says, Then the Lord passed by in front of him, that's Moses, and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in love and kindness, who keeps love and kindness for thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin, yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. So as I'm reading this Old Testament text, God being the same yesterday, today, and forever, I'm reading this text, what do I learn about God? What do I learn about his character? Well, he's compassionate. He's gracious. It takes a lot to get him angry. He's slow to anger. He's abounding in loving kindness. And he's, he's abounding in, in truth. That word loving kindness is a wonderful word to take a deep dive into, by the way. And he is always forgiving. He forgives iniquity and transgression and, and sin. Aren't you glad that that's true of God? Amen. That's God's nature. And so when we read an Old Testament passage like that, we learn a lot about God. Oh, and by the way, 
the text also says he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. So this God who is gracious and compassionate and slow to anger and filled with love and kindness, he's also a God that's going to punish sin. Someone just thinks he gets by with doing something evil. He will never get by with such with God, not unless he repents of it and asks God's forgiveness. Because God's not going to leave the guilty to be unpunished. So again, we learn a lot about the character of God. And there's a lot of people today that want to hear about the love and the kindness and gracious and graciousness and, and mercy of God. They don't want to hear very much about the judgment of God. But see, the same passage teaches, teaches us one thing, turns around and teaches us the other too. And so it becomes very important that we learn about God. When I'm reading through the scriptures, I'm going to ask myself the question, is there a command here for me to obey? I, I suppose that clear-cut commands in Scripture should be uh, the most important things that we can see, or, or at least it's the easiest scene, right? He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. We see these and so many other commands, and we, and we understand that uh, these can be obeyed. We can do these things. You know, there's one estimate that says there are 54 commands. In the book of James alone, and so it's good to be able to recognize these commands and, and make personal application. Just look at James 2 when you go home and read that text and see what commands there that you find. So as I'm reading the scriptures and I want to be able to connect the dots, I want to ask, what does the text say? What does it mean? What does it mean to me? Is there something in this text that tells me about God? Is there a command here for me to obey? I might even want to ask, is there an example here for me to follow? You know, so much of the Bible is biographical information, particularly as you look into the Old Testament. From the story of Abraham to the life of Christ, the Bible is just full of examples that we need to imitate in our lives. So ask yourself, is there someone in this context who is exhibiting a godly trait that I need to imitate in my life? For example, let's go back to Noah in Genesis chapter 6. In Genesis 6 and verse 14, the Bible tells Noah to make an ark, uh, make yourself an ark of gopher wood, and you shall make uh, the ark with rooms, and you shall cover it inside and out with pitch. Now, I don't live in the context that Noah lived in. God has not said he's going to destroy the earth by water again. In fact, he's told us he's not going to do that. So that's not a command that I need to obey. But later on in verse 22, when God told him to build that ark, here's what Noah did. Thus Noah did according to all that God commanded him, so he did. And so what do I learn from that text? No matter what God commands me to do, no matter what God asks me to do, here's an example of a man who did just exactly what he did and he saved him, uh, he, what God commanded him to do, so he saved himself and he saved his household. And so from his example, I learned that I need to obey God as, as well. Another question that we might ask is, is there some practical inference from a passage I am reading? Uh, an inference that I need to draw. Open your Bibles to the book of Mark chapter 14. Mark chapter 14. We'll read a few verses here beginning in verse 3, just kind of as a, as a casual illustration of what we're talking about. Is there some practical inference that I need to draw from what I'm reading? Mark chapter 14 and verse 3 says, While he was in Bethany at the home of Simon the leper and reclining at the table, there came a woman with an alabaster vial, a very costly perfume of pure nard, and she broke the vial and poured it over his head. But some were indignant, remarking to one another, Why has this perfume been wasted? For this perfume might have been sold for over 300 denarii and the money given to the poor. And they were scolding her. But Jesus said, Let her alone. Why do you bother her? She's done a good deed to me. For you always have the poor with you, and whenever you wish, you can do good to them, but you do not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for burial. Now, you know, when I read that verse 8 there, when I, when I see that this woman had done everything she could do, she has done what she could, I may realize, you know, I'm never going to be in the circumstances she's, she's in, I'm never going to be in a place where uh, I can have the opportunity to be in Jesus' literal presence. I know I'm not going to be able to uh, anoint him like she did, but why is this text written? 
Well, why did the Holy Spirit include this uh, in this passage? Well, there's a, this unique statement here. She has done what she could. Do you reckon we can infer something from that? Do you reckon we ought to be able to see that we should do what we can in the kingdom of God? That sometimes there are some things we can't do. Some things are beyond our reach. But sometimes there are things that we can't. There's always things that we can do. And so that's what our scripture is telling us that, that we should do. There's another one of these passages in Acts chapter 8 and verse 4 where we read that Saul was wreaking havoc upon the church there in the city of Jerusalem. And verse 4 says, devout men carried Stephen and of course they made great lamentation over him. They, were, they buried him. And in verse 4 the text says, therefore those who had been scattered abroad, all because of persecution, those who had been scattered abroad went about preaching the word. Is there some kind of implication, inference that I need to make from that? If they went even during that difficult time of great persecution, if they went about preaching the word, don't you think that I should infer that I ought to be doing the same thing? I ought to be teaching and I ought to be preaching the word. Don't you think that I ought to be able to connect the dots? Do you see what I'm talking about? I ought to be able to connect the dots. Another question that I need to ask myself is, is there a condition I need, to, I need to meet in order to be able to receive a blessing? You know, many of the promises that, that God gives to us are conditional promises. Many of the blessings that God wants to confer upon us are, are promises that he's laid down conditions that I must meet in order to be able to receive. The obvious example of this is Acts 2.38, repent and be baptized. Each one of you for the name of Jesus in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. If I want to receive the forgiveness of my sins, if I want the blood of Christ to cleanse me, then I need to do what this text tells me to do. I need to meet that condition. If I were to lay a hundred dollar bill up here, I'd have to borrow one from Brother Wendell here. But if I'd lay a hundred dollar bill up here and say, you know, if you will come up and and get the and and, and pick up this hundred dollar bill, you can have it. I think you I think you would understand that you can't just sit in your seat and to be able to get the blessing of that hundred dollar bill. You're gonna have to get up out of your seat, you're gonna have to come here, you're gonna have to get it, right? We understand that there are conditions to certain blessings. We've got to understand that God does the same thing for us. He lays down conditions in order for us to be able to attain certain blessings. And so we've got to be prepared to recognize that conditions are a part of promises that God gives to us and that we need to strive to meet every one of them. Now another thing that we need to see, we need to ask ourselves, is there a sin I need to avoid? When I'm reading the scriptures, I'm wanting to connect the dots now. Is there a sin I need to avoid in this text? Yeah, I think about reading Genesis chapter 4. And you read the first few verses there and you've got the conflict between Cain and Abel. Uh, you know how that Abel did what God wanted him to do with regard to his sacrifice. He offered it by faith, but Abel didn't do that. Or Cain didn't do that rather. And, and Cain got angry about that. And in fact, his heart was filled with hatred toward his brother. And what did he do? But, but he took the life of his brother. He murdered his brother. Now, as you read the consequences that Cain faced as a result of what he did, do you not think that in order to connect the dots, I ought to be able to think, that, you know, if, even if I have some kind of conflict with my brother, I don't need to hate him. I certainly don't need to murder him. That that would be the wrong thing to do because it's going to bring grave consequences in my life. I better connect those dots or I'm in trouble. I'm in deep trouble. You think about David and his adulterous tryst with Bathsheba in 2 Samuel chapters 11 and 12. He was in the wrong place, doing something he should not have been doing, he saw Bathsheba. He called her to himself after lusting after her. She came. He committed adultery with her. Brought grave consequences to David for the rest of his life. He died suffering from the consequences of that sin. Do you think as, as we read that text that we ought to be able to connect the dots and realize that if we do the same thing that David did, we're going to run into the same kind of problems that David had? 
It's just simply a matter of being able to connect the dots. Uh, you see the consequences of the rich barn builder who didn't have room in his heart for God. Or you think about the lying of Ananias and Sapphira and the consequences that had. You read those uh, accounts and you realize, hey, I don't need to do what they did. You need to be able, if you want to make practical application of these things, you need to be able to connect the dots. Then there's, there are passages like Colossians chapter 3. Class, uh, passages that, that mention specific sins. Therefore consider, beginning in verse 5, the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality and impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed which amounts to idolatry. For it is because of those things that the wrath of God will come upon the sons of disobedience. And in them you also once walked when you were living in them. But now you also put them all aside. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive speech from your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you laid aside the old self with its evil practices. So as you read this text, you realize that the Apostle Paul is, is death to these sins. He, he's saying you've got to put these things to death. They're in your life. You've got to get rid of them. And if we want to please God, we've got to know, we've got to connect the dots and realize that when we read such a list of sins, that we better not have these sins in our life. God's not going to tolerate it. But then, you know, the, the reverse of that, or somewhat the reverse of that is true, because sometimes there are, as we read, we can see that there are character traits that, that we need to develop in our lives. Second Peter chapter 1. Peter says, now for this very reason, applying all diligence, he's talking about partaking of the divine nature, applying all diligence in your faith, supply moral excellence in your moral excellence knowledge, and your knowledge self-control, and in your self-control perseverance, and in your perseverance godliness, and your godliness brotherly kindness, and in your brotherly kindness love. I think that sometimes we read a passage like that. And what happens is, is, we think, yeah, this is, this is the way I need to be. And so we think, well, this is the way that I am. And so we just kind of naturally think that because uh, we read a passage like this or we're around other good people, that all of a sudden this is a part of our lives too. And then somebody comes along and then they, they test our temper and we fail the test. Everybody, anybody ever lost their temper with somebody else, even someone they love the most? You've lost your temper there? Now you read this passage. You maybe even could quote the major part of this passage because some, some of our kids do because we talk to them about these godly virtues that they need to add to our lives. I'm, I'm saying you can't assume these. That's what I want to say. You've got to be intentional. When you read this passage of Scripture, you've got to be intentional to see that these are traits in my life that I can't take for granted, that, that I need to intentionally develop in my life. And I need to be thinking about them all the time because they're the things that God teaches me to do. I think also that we need to look into a text and, and ask ourselves the question, is there a promise in this text that I need to accept? I, I'm not quite sure we're really good at that accepting a promise that God has given us. You know, God actually makes promises in the New Testament. And by the way, every time God makes a promise, He's going to keep His promise. He is a God who is covenantly faithful and He's going to do exactly what He said that He would do. So if there's such a, a promise in the text that you're studying, what you need to do is you just need to believe and be comforted and be strengthened uh, by the promise of God. Think about Hebrews chapter 13 with me for just a moment. Hebrews chapter 13, verses 5 and 6. Here the Hebrews writer says, Make sure that your character is free from the love of money, being content with what you have. For he himself said, I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you. So that we may confidently say, The Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What will man do to me? Times get tough. You know anything about tough times? You ever had tough times in your life? Sure. We all have. We read this passage and what do we need to know about it? You know, your neighbors may forsake you. 
Your friends may forsake you sometimes. Hopefully it doesn't happen. But maybe even your brothers and sisters in Christ may forsake you. Sometimes even the one you love the most, your, your husband, your wife, uh, you know, they may, they may forsake you. But what God says is, I will never forsake you. I will never forsake you. We used to say God and one's a majority in any battle. Well, God's the majority in any battle. We just tag along, right? And believe what he said. Believe that God said, look, you're my child. I'm not going to give up on you. I'm not going to forsake you. You may leave me. That's on you. But if you do what I tell you to do, I will never forsake you. And there's a promise we need to accept. And we need to believe and we need to find comfort. You want to get rid of a lot of the discouragement and the depression in this world? Just believe that promise. Accept that. Internalize that promise. What a wonderful promise it is. You know, if you're trying to connect the dots, maybe sometimes you just need to memorize a, a verse of Scripture. Is there a verse that I need to memorize as I'm trying to connect these dots? You know, David said, Your word I've treasured in my heart that I may not sin against you in Psalm 119 and verse 11. You can do that by memorization. And that, what that means is, is that when you're faced with a temptation, you can think, I know what God said about that. Now, you don't have to memorize every passage of Scripture in the Bible. But there are some you do need to memorize. There are some you do need to know. And if you can't quote it verbatim, maybe you can know where it is and turn your Bible to read it. You can make sure that you know enough about it that when you're faced with temptation, where you turn is the Scriptures. You know, you study Jesus' uh, temptations in uh, Matthew chapter 4 and, and Luke 4 and see how he responded to Satan's temptations. You remember those three very important words? It is written. It is written. It is written. So sometimes what we need to know is we just need to memorize a passage of Scripture. If we're trying to connect the dots between what the Bible teaches what the Bible clearly says, what the Bible clearly means with my life. That's where the rubber theology meets the road of our lives. That's where we make everything practical. Sometimes we may need to ask, is there an era that I need to mark? As I'm reading this passage, is there an era I need to mark? Let me tell you what I mean by that. We need to learn to recognize when a passage that we're reading exposes some commonly held doctrinal error. For example, a lot of our friends believe that many, uh, that many of them believe that baptism has nothing to do with salvation. By the way, you want to know what I'm going to preach on? We're going to preach on that tomorrow night, okay? We're going to talk about the subject of baptism. We're going to take a deep dive there. And so we'll talk about that. So many believe that baptism has nothing to do with salvation. But you see, you've read Mark 16, 16, that said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be condemned. You've read that, haven't you? Yeah. Now I want to tell you something. I don't care how slick the denominational preacher is. I don't care how many words that he may say to deny that. At the end of the day, you can just say, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. And nothing is going to change that. Nothing is going to change that. I remember uh, reading about a man who was a debater back in the, uh, I, I guess it was the early 1900s that he lived. He was having a debate out in Texas with this Baptist preacher, and this Baptist preacher, they were talking about baptism. He didn't believe that baptism was essential salvation. He had the first speech, which was about 30, 45 minutes long, and, and he made his spill to show that, uh, as, at least as he believed, that baptism wasn't essential salvation. And then he got up, the, the gospel preacher got up, and he said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. And he sat down. And the Baptist preacher got up again and he, he went on to talk about how the man is saved uh, by faith before and without water baptism. The gospel preacher got up and said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He sat down again. That so uh, disconcerted that false teacher that he finally just got up and walked out the door. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. 
Now you may not know a lot about the Bible, but if someone comes along and tells you that baptism has nothing to do with salvation, all you've got to do is read that passage. Because there's nothing he can say that's going to deny that. Because that's the words of Jesus himself. And by the way, those are in red, just, just so you know. Uh, you may hear someone say, well, you know, I believe in eternal security. I believe that once a person is saved, he's always saved. There's nothing that he can do. And he says, if you don't believe that, let me show you. My sheep hear my voice and I know them. They follow me and I give eternal life to them and they will never perish. That's what Jesus said. And no one will snatch them out of my Father's hand. My Father who's given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. You see, once you're saved, you're always saved. Sounds good. Maybe we'd like to believe that, right? But the problem with that is, is he overlooks a very important part of the passage that he read. Verse 27 said, My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. So if you want to have the blessing of eternal security, what do you have to do? You've got to hear the words of God and you've got to follow Jesus. That's what you've got to do. And so there are some people who don't follow Jesus, don't do what he says. So whether it's on the inerrancy of Scripture or the organization of the church, recognize how certain truths of the Scripture expose doctrinal error. And it's a lot simpler to expose doctrinal error than a lot of people think. Then here's another thing that we need to ask, and we're just casually reading the scriptures, okay? We casually come to Mark 16, or we come to uh, Luke, uh, Luke chapter 24, the end of it there, or into Matthew chapter 28, and we read one of those accounts of the Great Commission. According to Mark, he said, go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. We know that, don't we? That is a challenge. It was a challenge to the very first people to whom Jesus spake those words. And guess who else it's a challenge to? It's a challenge to you. It's not just a challenge to write a check so that Philip or David or someone else like me uh, will go and teach the gospel. That's not it. While we are certainly thankful for the blessings you confer on us enabling us to preach the gospel as we do, a laborer is worthy of his hire. Once you've done that, you haven't escaped your responsibility to take the gospel and teach your neighbor. All the world may be just across the fence behind you, across the creek. That's as far as you have to go. But you need to be taking the gospel to somebody else. And that is a challenge. You're going to rise to meet that challenge. You know, I want to take just a moment as we think about this to... Talk about some of the dots that people don't always connect. And, and I want to make this especially applicable to, to me and, and, and to you. The first thing I want you to think about is Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. And the priorities that you choose in your life. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. I, I think here it, are some dots that people really don't connect when it comes to serving the Lord. Do you realize what the Lord is asking you to do? He's asking you to take your body, your arms, your legs, your mouth, your ears. He's asking you to take your body and sacrifice them for His cause. To present your bodies as a living sacrifice to God. Now what that says is that as you go throughout life, you're going to set certain priorities and parameters for your life. Is God always going to be number one? That's what He's going to lay claim to. He always has to be number one. But seek first. His kingdom and His righteousness. Matthew 6 and verse 33. You've got to lay yourself at the altar of His service and that applies to every single one of us. Let me show you another passage. And this is, uh, you might call, think I'm meddling here. 1 Timothy 2, 9 and 10. 
Likewise, I want women to adorn themselves with proper clothing, modestly and discreetly, not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly garments, but rather by means of good works as is proper for women making a claim to godliness. Sometimes I think we have lost the battle to modesty. Because men, you allow your girls to wear things that they should never wear, and sometimes you will see them even in services. Dresses too low, dresses too high, dresses too tight of the wrong kind of material, going places, displaying their bodies in a way that should not happen. Folks, you can't overlook that. These are dots that you need to connect. Your soul is at stake. Then there's the matter of Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24 and 25, engaging a spiritual interest. That passage says, let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together as the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Now I realize that because you're here on Monday night to listen to this old uh, preacher from Alabama teaching that, that I probably God's probably won this battle with you already, okay? Because you're here tonight, that says something special about you. But, you know, we come to this passage and what we do is we use it to beat people over the head with the idea that they're not attending services like they ought to. And, of course, there's an application there. I don't want to overlook that. But what I'm also wanting to say is that if you want to show somebody that you're spiritually interested, where's the first place you're going to do it? It's going to be when God's people come together. Amen. Right? And so we're going to be able to see one another's spiritual interest. First and foremost, this is not the only way we see it, but first and foremost, by the way, we attend worship. And again, like I said, I realize I'm preaching to the choir now because you're here tonight uh, in, in the week, and this is not one of those required times of assembly for you. Some of you even visiting and come here. But the point of the matter is there's an application to be made here that people don't always connect. Your spiritual interest is displayed by how much you're willing to stimulate your brothers and sisters to good deeds. Amen. And you do that when we come together. One final place. Matthew 18, verses 7 through 9. Matthew 18, verse 7 through 9. Woe to the world because of its stumbling blocks. For it is inevitable that stumbling blocks come, but woe to that man through whom the spirit stumbling block comes. If your right hand or if your hand or your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it from you. It is better for you to enter life crippled and lame than to have two hands or two feet and be cast in eternal fire. If your eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out and throw it from you. It's better for you to enter life with one eye than to have two eyes and be cast into fiery hell. God is not calling upon you to mutilate your bodies here. That's not the point that he's making. This is a figure of speech called a hyperbole, which is a, an exaggeration to prove a point, to make a point. If you're caused to stumble or you're causing somebody else to stumble, you've got to remove whatever that source of stumbling is regardless of the sacrifice that you have to make. Let me just illustrate it with one thing here. The church is being eat up today with both men and women watching, viewing pornography. Just eat up. You would be, I, I would be absolutely shocked to death if there's not more than one person. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but if there's not more than one person who either has had a problem with pornography or is having a problem with pornography right now here in this audience. Because that's how prevalent it has become among our people. Okay? Now what this means is that there's some drastic changes that have to be made. And it may be that you need to get rid of the internet. It may mean that you need to you know, take your television and rip it off the wall, no matter how much you paid for that 78 inch uh, flat screen, and throw it out the door because watching a Tennessee or Kentucky football game is not worth losing your soul over. So what you have to do is make sure that you do whatever it takes in order to be able to overcome that sin and any other sin, by the way. Make sure that you're willing to make whatever sacrifice is necessary in order to be able to avoid sin. Well, 
Let me talk about a couple of other things here just a minute. Why, why do people not connect the dots? And there's, there's only, I think, about four or five reasons. You know, some people don't have the will or the commitment to connect the dots. Uh, they just don't. In, in religion today, most people want emotion. They want warm relationships rather than diligent study and, and committed and changed lives. And so, uh, you know, they read these texts and they'll read about the love of Jesus and, and any time they read about something that's required of them or a passage that's going to expose some sin in their life, they're just going to read over it or skip it all together. And, and, and not make that application. They just don't have the will to connect the dots. They don't have the commitment to do it. Some people are afraid of the consequences. And they're not willing to accept the consequences of what they read. How many times have you talked to some of your denominational friends about Mark 6, 16, 16 or 1 Peter 3, 21 about, about baptism and, and they really believe what you say but they're unwilling to accept the consequences. It means they may have to leave the religion of their mother or their father. It means they're going to have to give up some other things that they're associated. They may not be able to play the piano anymore. They're going to have to change. And so because they see those consequences, they're not going to connect the dots, Right? Some people do not place a priority on spiritual things. They're kind of like the thorny soil that, that Jesus talked about in Matthew chapter 13 and, and in Luke chapter 8. And, and they've got so many thorns, so many bushes and weeds growing in their lives that spiritual things are just choked out. And so while they may casually read the Bible and know that there's a better life out there somewhere, they just don't have time right now. That has robbed so many churches of servants that I just can't tell you. And especially even of elders. I, I've seen that uh, recently where people uh, would be, uh, you would think about them serving, but don't, oh, I can't because I, I've got things in my job that just, uh, I just don't have time to serve. Truth of the matter is, uh, they control their time a lot of the time. Yeah. And they could do what they need to do, but there's just too many weeds. There's just too many weeds. And then sometimes, and maybe this may be even the most of the time, people just assume a knowledge that they don't have. You, you know, when you get into talking about any kind of religious issue with someone, whether it be instrumental music or baptism or uh, eternal security, any of those subjects, what happens sometimes is that, is that uh, people just assume they know their doctrine when they really don't know and they're not willing to hear anything else. They just don't know what the Bible says. And because of that, they can't connect the dots. Well, Jesus said, you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. If you'll connect the dots, you can find the freedom that is in Jesus Christ. It's a challenge, but it's also a promise that you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. My question is this, will you rise to that challenge, studying God's word, making practical use of that in everyday life? It'll, it'll make you a better husband, a better wife, a better uh, father, mother, a, a better son or daughter. It'll make you a better uh, a neighbor or citizen or employee or employer or citizen or friend, a better neighbor. If you're absorbed with God in the Bible, if you're absorbed in his servants, it, it'll make you in, in service, it'll make you a better member of the body of Christ. Just if you'll be able to read and know the scriptures, connect the dots. Thank you for listening. I appreciate very much the fact that you would come. There may be someone here that has listened to this lesson and realized, yes, there are some dots I need to connect. And so if we can help you in your obedience to the gospel, we'll be glad to do that. If you'll just come to the front while together we stand and we sing, won't you come?